recent drop in prices in consumer graphics cards has also brought used enterprise GPUs tumbling down. Don't worry, I'll be here to catch them when they fall. Today's video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Tower 500. Turn heads with the distinct vertical chassis design of the Tower 500. The wide open interior means unparalleled versatility for your dream build. With support for EATX, CEB, or even EEB motherboards, and space for more fans and cooling options than you can possibly comprehend, you can not only make your build look incredible, but keep it cool too. And thanks to three tempered glass side panels, you can enjoy panoramic views of your PC's inner workings. How's your build in luxury with the Thermaltake Tower 500? Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Over the years, I've taken a look at a number of enterprise GPUs in hopes of saving them from e-waste. Some of those attempts have been more successful than others, but never had I had the opportunity to test a GPU that technically doesn't even exist. On the table next to me is the NVIDIA Grid M40. Not to be confused with the NVIDIA Tesla M40. And don't bother trying to look up that part number on NVIDIA's website, you're not going to find it. As best I can tell, these were custom cards sold to OEMs like HP Enterprise and Dell for VDI-specific applications, and no public drivers were ever made available. But when have I ever let something like that stop me? The Grid M40 started showing up on random corners of internet forums as far back as 2016, mostly asking the same question. I found this random NVIDIA GPU, and what can I use it for? In Linux, you can install standard NVIDIA drivers and enable features like CUDA and NVENC, but without video outputs on the card, using it for rendering or gaming has been completely out of the question. There's also been conflicting reports about what hardware is actually inside these cards. Just looking at the back, you can tell it is not business as usual, as there is not a single GPU core. In fact, there are four GM107 GPU dies on the card, and that much has been known. The conflicting information is about the CUDA core count on each of those GPU dies. According to a Serve the Home article from 2016 that first dove into these cards, the GM107 had 640 CUDA cores and 4 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory per chip. Tech Power Up also has a listing for the Grid M40, but it lists just 384 CUDA cores, or roughly two-thirds of the power potential. In truth, both specs may actually be correct, as NVIDIA provides no official documentation for this particular card. It's quite possible there are multiple variants of Grid M40s that were sold to OEMs, including one with CUDA cores that had been disabled. What I can tell you is that this individual Grid M40 has 640 CUDA cores per GPU die, with a GPU clock of 1033 MHz and GDDR5 clocked at 1300. The GM107 is a Maxwell-based GPU, but was released mostly under the NVIDIA 700 series lineup as a low-power option. It was actually never used in the 900 series desktop GPU lineup either, but it did see a number of releases on laptops as the GTX 950M and the GTX 960M, along with various other low power quadro cards. Probably its most famous use was in the GTX 750Ti, where it also had 640 CUDA cores and a similar clock speed of 1085 MHz. There were a couple GM107 GPUs with only 384 CUDA cores released as well, such as the Quadro K620 or the OEM-only GTX 745, giving some credence to the idea there may be multiple versions of the Grid M40 floating around in the wild. Also, while NVIDIA SMI displays each GPU on this card as a Grid M40, the GPUs themselves show up in Proxmox as Tesla M10 GPUs, which also use the same GM107 and 640 CUDA cores. I've been aware of this card's existence for at least the last couple years, but due to GPU prices being astronomically high, I wasn't prepared to drop $500 on one. Settling back down to around the $100 mark made it a much more interesting proposition, as even if I couldn't get the card working, it might still make an interesting video. If you've not watched my most recent cloud gaming server tutorial, I'd recommend checking that out if you want a full breakdown on how I got the Grid M40 up and running. The link for that will be down in the video description. Given there are no public drivers or documentation on this card, I ran on the assumption that it was going to use the same vGPU drivers as other Maxwell-based GPUs like the Tesla M60. And I was right. Installing the NVIDIA Grid host driver and the vGPU unlock script presented all four GPUs on the Grid M40 with Maxwell-based vGPU profiles. So far, so good. 
As there's only 4 gigabytes of RAM and 640 CUDA cores per GPU, I'm only planning on running a single VM per GPU die. There's also that pesky 53 watt power limit on each GPU core, so overclocking is almost guaranteed to be out of the question. Once I had my four virtual machines set up, I assigned each a vGPU instance, installed the NVIDIA drivers, and nothing happened. The drivers were installed and the GPU was present in Device Manager, but the GPU wasn't connected to a display. While I've ran into this issue before, it's always been on GeForce cards running the vGPU unlock script, not on Tesla-based GPUs, which have virtual displays attached as part of the host driver in Linux. After a couple hours of troubleshooting, it turns out the issue was that the newest NVIDIA desktop driver disabled the virtual display. Now, I'm not sure if this is because Maxwell is no longer supported in the latest NVIDIA driver, or if this is a fix to people like me making vGPU work on cards that it was never intended to. But reverting back to an earlier desktop driver worked like a charm, and I was finally ready to start testing. I'm connecting to these virtual machines using Sunshine and Moonlight, which are open source re-implementations of NVIDIA's game streaming service used in GeForce Now. It's a great combination for playing games on just about any device from a virtual machine like this. And I've also got a full breakdown of how that works in another video. Again, link down in the description. Given the low specs of the GM107, I was not expecting much when it came to performance. Honestly, I was going to be surprised if Minecraft even ran. Now, I'm not going to come out and tell you that this card is a gaming powerhouse, but I still came away very impressed by what was possible at just 50 watts per GPU. Starting off, Minecraft had no trouble at all running at 1080p and 60 frames per second, and that was at just 25 watts of power. In theory, that means the Grid M40 would be capable of running eight individual instances of Minecraft on just 200 watts total, and that is definitely a result I did not expect. Now, before you ask, the Grid M40 was also capable of running Crisis at 1080p high settings and an average of 56 frames per second. Sure, it's not the most demanding of tests, but it's still an impressive result, and you know you wanted to know that anyway. But now it's time to uh, crank up the difficulty a little bit with Cyberpunk 2077. In order to get this game to run, I did have to turn things all the way down to 720p resolution and low settings. But in the end, the game was actually kind of playable at 27 FPS on average. Sure, it's not a terrific experience, but I managed to play all the way through Breath of the Wild on the Switch at the same frame rate. So it's definitely doable. Diablo 2 Resurrected averaged 47 frames per second, making the dungeon crawler a better experience than it ever was back in 2000 when it first released. All right, with that, I think I have enough to start drawing some conclusions on this card. While it performed well above my expectations, it still struggled to get over 30 FPS, even in some fairly undemanding games. 640 CUDA cores on the Maxwell architecture just isn't up to snuff when it comes to modern AAA games, even if this card does technically support DirectX 12 and Vulkan APIs. When it comes down to it, the Grid M40 really is just a conglomeration of four GTX 750 Ti's on a single PCB, but without the option for striping them all together in SLI. Each card is recognized and operates independently from the other GPUs, meaning the most you'll ever see in gaming is what you saw here today. If there weren't other Tesla GPUs available at this price point, I'd say it's actually decent performance when you consider it's $25 per virtual machine that you can run. But even with a combined 2,560 CUDA cores, it still falls short of the NVIDIA Tesla M40, which has 3,072, and can also be split into multiple VMs using the same vGPU unlock script. The Grid M40 is definitely an interesting card, and considering the only officially supported vGPU cards on the Maxwell architecture were the Tesla M10, basically a carbon copy of this card with double the memory, and the Tesla M60, a dual 2000 CUDA core monster that ran a paltry $6,000 at launch. I can see where the Grid M40 may have had some value when it comes to VDI environments. But even at the $100 it sells for now, and given the progress in virtualizing both enterprise and consumer GPUs, there are far better options for this same price point. If the Grid M40 falls into your lap, it's not completely worthless for older titles, and would even make a Dynamite emulation VM or 720p gaming rig for a DIY streaming Steam Deck. But with the Tesla M40 available for the same price point, and as it can run two virtual machines at up to three times the speed as a single Grid M40 GPU, the Grid M40 makes less and less sense. If you are interested in a Grid M40, I will have eBay affiliate links down in the video description. 
Of course, there's also gonna be links to the Tesla M40. So do with that information what you will. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is not a beer at all. In fact, it is a cider from Cider Boys. It is the Pineapple Hula Apple Pineapple Hard Cider, clocking in at 5%. If there's one thing pineapple belongs in, it's cider. If there's two things, it's pizza. <laughs> sort by controversial. <laughs> <laughs> this guy eats pineapple and pizza, get him. So I'm going to be honest, I've had the cider numerous times before, and it is one of my favorites. Uh, cider Boys is one of those companies that really never fails to impress. This is everything that you would want it to be. It's pineapple and apple in a cider together, mixing absolutely perfectly. You get that, that real citrus tang from the pineapple right up front. And then the sweetness of both fruits just kind of carries it through. Very drinkable, very good. Good with just about any meal or on a nice hot summer day. Go grab one.